Indeed, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to follow the honourable lady, the member for Mid Bedfordshire. And uh, I don't agree with the thrust, of the main thrust of what she said, but she did some, make some very, very useful and pertinent comments about what the Attorney General said yesterday in terms of the analysis of where we find ourselves. I, I agree with her and other honourable and right honourable members who have praised the Attorney General and his candour and his. Uh, and his honour and what he has uh, brought to this House yesterday in terms of more truthfulness, if I can say, about wh what this deal actually means, in contrast to others who have been prepared to say things to the press and media. He came here as a member of the Cabinet and told us some of the unvarnished truth about this uh, agreement. So I do praise him for that and join with the Honourable Lady in what she has said, because when I went through the adjectives that he used in his devastating commentary yesterday about this deal being a calculated risk, unattractive, unsatisfactory, undesirable, that it did provide no unilateral exit clause for, for, for the United Kingdom, it was indefinite, no unilateral right to terminate. But he asked us to take it on trust that it would all never happen because, believe it or not, having spent 18 months negotiating all of this, the EU and the Irish government don't actually want to implement any of it. The fact is, Mr Speaker, that despite all of the candour and all of what was said yesterday, the coming to this House and making, yes, two and a half hours of an oral statement and taking all the questions and providing the reasoned position paper does not actually fulfil the order, the motion that was passed by this House, which was for the final and full advice provided by the Attorney General to the Cabinet to be published. Now, the Government may not like the fact that this was passed by this House. But it cannot simply wish it otherwise. During the course of the debate on the 13th of November, it argued that it would do precisely what it has now done. That was rejected by the House. The, pass, the House passed a different motion. And it is not good enough now for ministers, and it's not particularly the Attorney General we single out, because I don't, he said himself in the, in, the, in the statement yesterday that he wished that he wasn't in the position that he was in. But it is the government as a whole which is collectively responsible for deciding that it will simply ignore this binding effective motion and revert to doing what it said it would do during the debate. Well, quite frankly, Mr Speaker, that cannot be allowed to stand. We have heard a lot of talk about precedent and about conventions of this House and, and respect for all of that. Well, surely this is one area where the Government must respect uh, the will of Parliament and simply cannot set it aside. The Father of the House in his intervention earlier made a very interesting and, and, and I think a positive contribution about a way round this. But it is interesting that the government did not take that up. It did not take it up during the course of this debate, and it has not taken it up previously. So clearly the government is not interested, it appears, it certainly has not said anything publicly up to now about taking that suggestion uh, forward. What it has done is say, no, no, it does not matter what is said by this House, it does not matter what other suggestions are out there, we are going to stick to the plan. They obviously have a grid somewhere where this is on the plan that they will publish this reasoned summary position paper and have a statement, and that is it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this House will have the final say, and I hope that it will reiterate what it has previously ordered on the 13th of November to be done. Now, we are told that this is unprecedented. There are, of course, it was said in the other place yesterday, that in its exceptional circumstances, advice like this can be published. I have also heard the argument used that this is privileged. But, of course, privilege in, in the lawyer-client relationship belongs to the client, not the lawyer, not the person given the advice. The lawyer has a duty to protect the client's privilege. But the reality is that if the client waives that, then the uh, lawyer, the provider of the advice, is quite at liberty to disclose. So this argument about privilege is, is, is a bogus argument. The Attorney General says that he would wish to comply. Well, the Attorney General said yesterday, and the Leader of the House, 
I, wish it, I wish I could comply with the order of the House, but it's not in the national interest, not in the public interest. I'm afraid it's not the duty or the job of any government minister to decide that. The House has decided what it wishes to do, and it's not for a government minister to unilaterally override that with no good reason. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. The right one gentleman is very kind to give way. He's a patriot, and I know that he therefore understands national security and national interest. Would you agree with me, however, that quite probably within the legal advice that the Attorney General gave to the government would have been an analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the Irish government's position? And does he agree that to publish that in full would actually hand to the Irish government an advantage in any subsequent negotiation? I'm, te- I'm, tempted to say, I'm tempted to say to the Honourable Gentleman, I think the massive advantage to the Irish Government and other governments under the European Commission is handed over in this withdrawal agreement in terms of future leverage over the negotiations. But I don't accept what he says because the Attorney General went on record yesterday as saying that there was nothing to see. Nothing to see here. So there obviously is nothing of concern about national security in this. That's what, that's what he said himself. So I I don't accept what he has said. The reality is, Mr Speaker, that had the government, this debate was had on the 13th of November. The government had the choice to vote against and decided not to vote against because they feared that they would lose the vote. And it cannot be the case, it cannot be the case that by abstaining from a vote on a humble address that that invalidates the motion because that would be a very, very serious precedent to set indeed. So, Mr Speaker, we have had the situation where some of this legal advice, as given by the Attorney to the Cabinet, and it is that advice that is crucial that we must have, has already been leaked by members of the Cabinet to the press and media. And the Attorney General, I think, accepts that. So the reality is that members of the Cabinet Members of the Cabinet have already released some of this advice given by the Attorney in terms to the Cabinet to members of the press and media. I think that uh, the Attorney is somewhat stopped, if I may use a legal phrase, from saying that the rest of us, therefore, are not entitled to have that. I think if some members of the select uh, media and press are entitled, then I think the members of this House are entitled to have this advice. I'll give way to my honourable friend. Will you remember agree with me as well that if the government and the Prime Minister is going round the country trying to convince the populace that this is a good deal, that this approach, this secret approach, only confirms in people's minds that there is something to hide. Yeah. And in fact, if anything, the government is scoring an own goal by yeah. refusing to publish this advice. I I thank my right honourable friend, and indeed that very point about the government actually scoring a massive own goal in its own terms has been made not from these benches but by by a former cabinet minister on their own side and by many honourable members on the the government benches. So the the right honourable member sums it up very well. What is there to hide, given that the attorney has said there is nothing to see, given the fact that we have the clear motion passed in terms by this House. It is absolutely vital now that that is enforced and the bogus arguments against it are rejected. Thank you. Mr Dominic Grieve. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm not sure that members of the public coming in to uh, watch our debates would necessarily appreciate our role as the High Court of Parliament, but that is what we are. And 